Isn't that sexy? It's all about spawning. But anyway, we play the sexy music and we have guests on. Last year, we had two other podcasters on uh, who were female podcasters. And we did uh, a quiz show where they had to guess, well, guess what we're talking about, a sex toy or a fly. Super excited to have Clay Groves on from the Fish Nerds podcast. Clay is one of the longest running uh, fishing podcasts out there. And a guy who always brings it with some killer, crazy stories, and uh, and he doesn't disappoint today. So, uh, so here we go. Let's let's do this with uh, Clay Groves from Fish Nerds. Uh, happy to introduce uh, the chief executive fish nerd uh, Clay uh, from the Fish Nerds podcast. How's it going, Clay? Thank you. Thank oh, you. Wow. Love that. So happy to be here. Yes. Thank you. Oh, slow down. Calm down. I'm down. Damn, It'll be okay. That's nice. I'm very happy to be here. I'm taking over, Dave. So. <laughs> Love it. You're a po- See, that's why I, if I could just interview all podcasters at all fishing podcasters, I'd be happy. <laughs> we have so much fun. I'm so happy to be here. I haven't talked to you in a couple of years. Yep. We, were, uh, we talked to, oh, gosh, maybe three years now. It's been a long time. I know. I know. Yeah, I, had, I was on your show. Yeah. Well, you're going to be on my show again, too, because I'm going to flip this and use this on my show as well. Oh, so sweet. It'll be a uh, swap cast. As Sweet. All right. Well, I'll do my own promotional stuff. I think I don't have my button set up here, but I'll you know add something maybe to mine. But sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we're we're talking. Uh, we're going to talk trout today, and it sounds like uh, you know ice fishing is something that I've never done, and I've heard a lot about, and I and I I'm curious about it because I want to know like why ice fishing, you know, and if you could compare ice fishing to say fishing in uh, Costa Rica. If they're equivalent or if they're a little bit different, we can. We'll, they're precisely the same thing. All right, all right. Because I got to I'm trying to plan a trip uh, to somewhere down south uh, later this uh, this winter. If I will, depending on COVID, obviously. Sure. But I want to hear about this ice fishing thing. So so let's jump into it. But before we get there, just first, the fish nerds. You're whenever I hear uh, podcasters or fisher, you know, fishing people in that space, your podcast always comes up. Dave Jackson all these people, the fish nerds. So tell us about the fish nerds, what it is for somebody who's never been there. All right. Well, so, so what we started off, believe it or not, as a quest, we were, my friend Dave and I, who's no longer on the podcast, but we originally started off, started off as writers. We were working on a project. We were trying to catch and eat every kind of freshwater fish in the state of New Hampshire. And that was where it started. And we had a, almost had a book deal. We had all these magazine articles we were writing and uh, the book deal fell through because we weren't reaching a larger audience. And they said, why don't you start podcasting? And we did. And we realized that nobody was listening to podcasts either. And that didn't help us one bit with our book deal. <laughs> so, but we found podcasting to be way more fun than writing. And uh, we turns out there are tons of people who want to talk about all kinds of fishy things. We talk about fish, fishing and eating fish. And everything is fair game about fish. We may one, one week we might do all really hardcore biology with our fishy science correspondent, Doc Martin. And the next week we might do a cooking segment and we might do a how-to fish segment and we do a fish in the news and we always have a good time. Uh, we laugh a lot and uh, we are almost almost always true. Yeah, yeah, that's fishing. That's fishing. So you cover, so a little bit of everything. I mean, obviously ice fishing, you're a guide and I know I was listening to a recent episode you are talking about how even in the nasty weather you were forced out there because there was a paycheck on the end of it. So how is, how is that going? I mean, like when I think of guiding, I think of uh, a, like, like a different thing. Are you like in a tent huddled up next to your client and uh, just breaking out the I basics? Find, of I find if you can snuggle work? with your client at the beginning of a trip, it makes it a much better <laughs> trip, you know, because you're really intimate that way and you're warm. Um, no, no, a typical ice fishing trip, usually my clientele, I, I don't get a lot of hardcore, like, you know, anglers on an ice fishing trip. I, my target audience is families. And so we'll bring them out. We don't get up at the butt crack of dawn usually. <laughs> usually we roll out there around 10, 10 in the morning and we snowmobile out to a nice shack. We maybe go inside for a minute. I don't like people inside. Outside's where the action is. And fish, fly, ice fishing has become a very high tech sport. And this is why I like it. You know, like it, it requires, we have sonars, we have GPSs, our augers are made of steel that you can only get from the Highland Mountains you know, or Norway. And like, there's really specialized equipment. Um, and I like all that high tech stuff. And so I drew, I'll typically I'll drill before the clients arrive, I will drill 20 or 30 holes. Right. 
and I'll kind of identify where the fish are. And the reason I, way I do that is I drop a sonar in the water and I can see fish are there. And I like to start them where the fish live. And I usually typically I'll start clients catching small fish, yellow perch and dinky things just to get them in, used to catching fish. And then we move on to bigger, bigger game. Um, and there's a lot of different, it depends what they want to fish for. If they're trout fishing, it's a whole different thing. Maybe we should start there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. First of all, just sonar and breaking that out, I'm realizing, okay, the $300 for a guide is well worth the money because most people aren't going to break out sonar and know exactly where the fish are, right? You, you're gonna, if, if you, so if you have a family of four and you step on the ice with me, you are walking on the ice with $3,000 worth of equipment uh, the, second, the second you walk on the ice. So, yeah, and, and I'm not using higher end stuff. I can't afford that, but it's still expensive. Cool. So, so trout, so you have, um, I mean, like, I think you mentioned brook trout, lake trout. Yeah. So, yeah, let's talk, let's talk brook trout. So, brook trout fishing actually is a very different game. I'm going to start there. This is the simplest of all ice fishing, and it's the, probably the most fun. And the season for this, even though it's open all ice fishing season, typically the bite for this fish is only great for the first two to three weeks of the season. And the way we, so, so what the New Hampshire does is, I don't know about most states, but, but New Hampshire raises their own trout stocking programs. And do you know what broodstock yeah. trout are? Okay, so, so people who don't know, broodstock are the, the grandparent fish. They're the fish that are in the hatchery for four or five years who are making all the babies. That's your, your giant, it's your cows. It's the ones doing all the work. They get paid to reproduce over and over and over again. Well, every year they take, you know, thousands of these broodstock and they put them into the water for anglers to catch. And they're trophy sized fish. These are brook trout that are 18 inches long. They're huge fish which are, and they're beautiful. And so they drop them into a bunch of ponds and lakes and rivers around here. And when they freeze over, you can go target them. Uh, and by, by the way, you can target them before they freeze. People are fly fishing for them right now. And in the, the spots I like to fish are super shallow, sandy lakes that have a drop off for ice fishing for ice fishing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the typical, and so what I do is I walk out in the ice and this is the only time I bring clients out on thin ice because the, this, this literally the season wraps up when the ice gets thick. And so typically safe ice is four inches or thicker, but on this trip, and I tell the clients ahead of time, this is what's going to happen is we're going to go out on ice. That's two inches thick. That's not safe ice dangerous ice but we're fishing in water that's one foot deep so when you fall through not if you fall through when you fall through you just step there back up go. on the ice that's again. better yeah, <laughs> no yeah. big deal but here's why it's so cool we, we each person gets one fishing rod we don't use traps or anything like that and we take a little ice fishing fly usually uh just a little beadhead nymph with some hot yep. pink on it, whatever. I don't care what kind it is. As long as it has hot that's pink, it. that's my color. Two pound test line. You can use, you know, tippet material if that's what you got, but it's really thin line. And you walk out and you punch a hole in the ice with a drill or you chip it out with a chisel. And you can, and the water's crystal clear. In New Hampshire waters are very clear waters. And you can see the bottom. It's just sandy. Mm. <laughs> just, there's sand, there's water, and there's ice. And it's you standing right on top of it. And you just jig right in that hole and you watch your jig bounce up and down and you sing songs and you make it bounce and, and you wait a few minutes. And then you'll notice once in a while, you'll see the sand kind of blow past the hole and that's a, a fish is nearby. So you keep jigging and jigging and jigging and you notice that that's happening more and more. And then all of a sudden, like a herd of, <laughs> like a herd of uh, sheep, these giant fish are coming in chasing your jig. And then what I try to tell clients to do is play keep away. Don't let the first fish oh, wow. have it. Right. Because you want two or three fish getting really oh. aggressive, chasing it. Now you're fishing. No, you're fishing on top of these fish. You're at a foot of water. These fish are literally three inches from your feet and they can see you, but they don't care because they're Jeez. cows. They're, they're right. hatching fish. And yeah. so you, and if the, and the ice is clear, it's amazing because they're swimming and there's usually 15 or 20 of them swimming under your feet and you're jigging around and they're swiping at your bait and they've got terrible aim because they're not trained hunters. They're, they're pellet yep. eaters. So it takes a bunch of tries for them to catch your food. But when you hook them, they're huge. There's, you know, these 18 inch fish and you pull them out of the water, you take a picture. And... So how do you get them once you hook them? Because couldn't they just uh, like rip your, go under the ice further and kind of shave your stuff? That's exactly right. They could. And you're on thin ice, which would be sharper because it's, you know, not with that thin profile. So using two pound test, make sure you drag a set right when you hook it. And if they start running, you want to dip your rod tip in the water. So, that you're, so your, your line's not scraping the ice. 
Wow. Yeah. This sounds amazing. It's so actually. much fun. This, this <laughs> so sounds, much this fun. is not, this is not your normal. So I pictured ice fishing. I should have watched it. Is there a video on this that uh, you're talking about? I could send can you, you some stuff. Yeah. I would love to, I'd love to get a link to see because this just sounds amazing. This is not like sitting in a, uh, in a tent, which is the old f- picture of ice fishing, right? Or you're freezing your butt off. That, just well, we do our share of that too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you do. Yeah, for sure. You do. Yeah. What about when you took your clients out recently? Um, you know, from your last podcast, you mentioned you took them out and, uh, or maybe it wasn't the last one, but there was one you're talking about ice fishing and, and it was cold as, as <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, you would not have gone if it was just your personal day, but since you were making money on it, you went like, yeah. take us to that so moment. This was a, what, what, what so was that? this was a couple of years ago, actually it was in December oh, okay. and we had, so right, so right now, by the way, to kind of bring you to where we are now, 2020, December, what is it? The 11th of December. Yeah. I don't have any ice yet. I can't ice fish yet. Oh, wow. But, like global warming? I don't know, because it sometimes <laughs> some, occasionally happens, you know, where yeah. it just the temperature doesn't work out. But but okay. two years ago, we had a uh, subarctic freeze in December. We had sub-zero temperatures for like two weeks. So we had ice that we've never seen before. It dropped down to negative 20 for like four days in a row, and it was insanely cold. And we gained all this ice. So I put my shack out early, and I had clients who wanted to go out fishing, and it was... The day they wanted to go out fishing, and it was, I was new at the game, so it was my first, second year ice guiding, uh, I called the clients like before. I said, listen, it's, it's going to be negative 16 when you get up in the morning with 30-mile-an-hour winds. Do you want it, your money back? I'll just give you money back. And they're like, no, we booked a hotel room. We're, you know, we're in. And I'm like, oh, Christ. All right. Damn. All right, I'll be out there. So I get all bundled up. I drive the snowmobile out there. The snowmobile barely starts. Like the gas is frozen kind of cold. You know? Oh. And, I pick them up at our spot. I drive them to the ice shack. And, you know, here's the problem with fishing in an ice shack. It's warm inside. My ice shack, is, it's, I have an actual camper on the ice. It's 75 degrees inside there. Even when it's, oh, wow. Even when it's, like, a, like a camper, like yeah, a, 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 on the back of your pickup camper? Yeah, well, like a pop-up, you know, like a tent trailer that, I, you know, that pop up into a camp. Oh, yeah. I tore all the tenting out and built walls and put a heater in and holes nice. in the floor. So. So I put them in there to keep them warm. I fire up the heat. You know, we're doing great. But it's, you're, 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 when it's that cold, you're under a super high-pressure system, and the fish don't do much. They just sit in one spot under the ice. And t- fish, fish don't typically stay under an ice fishing shack. Um, hmm. I don't care how many signs I put down there say, hey, I'll be fishing at 10 a.m. <laughs> the, <laughs> the fish don't typically stay put. They move around a lot. So if you want to catch a lot of fish ice fishing, just like you would any other kind of fishing, you don't pick – like when you're fly fishing, you wouldn't pick a no. six inch pot, spot of river and cast that same spot all day long, would you? No, although, no, I wouldn't. But although I would say, I was going to note this earlier, you're talking about your, or not Euro nymphing, but the pink, right? I just, I did a recent post on Euro nymphing, which is, that's competitive fly fishing. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if you ever heard of that, but there's a no. team USA, actually a, a team, a, a, you know, uh, but they, they are stuck on these little tiny sections of river and they're f- competing. So God. they've got really good at, being good at fishing water that's been that's you know not great and you know the funny thing is they say the number one thing they use is a fly with a hot spot pink like you said or red or something like that so you're you're doing well there but no i hear you i mean i think you want to move around and so you're here you're stuck on a piece of ice and my other question too as you're going is this is the stupid question to me but how do you not melt the ice with your 70 degrees uh shack on top First of all, the shack's on on a on a trailer on wheels, so you're oh, already going gotcha. off the ice. I see. But you could make a fire right on top of the ice and not melt the ice. A heat rises, so it's oh right, not typically a problem. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> there. You might melt some of the snow, you know. Uh, so we're in there fishing, and I'm trying to get them to come outside and fish. So I'm drilling a bunch of holes and I'm jigging around, and I'm catching fish outside, and I'm bringing them to the door. I'm like, I got a crappie, you know, I got a bass. And they're like, Yeah, we're not coming out. <laughs> and uh. So I'm out there fishing. I set a few fish traps I don't usually do. Flag pops up. I'm like, there's a fish on the trap out there. You want to come pull them out of the water? And he's like, yeah, no, you caught that one. We didn't catch that one. I'm like, this, but oh. that's, that's the game. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> yep. That's why you hired a guy. Right. Uh, and, then, and they didn't catch anything for hours and hours and hours. And uh, it's just getting colder and colder out. And finally, uh, the guy hooks a bass. And it's massive. The drag is screaming out of um out of the reel and he's fighting and fighting and fighting and the bass isn't moving at all and then i i made the biggest blunder of all time i reached down and i just tightened his drag Ooh. just a little bit and then pink yep gone yep 
God, his only good fish the whole day. They oh. end up only making it about two and a half hours of a six hour trip. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the, even then, they even inside, it was starting to like, it was warm in there, but it was, you're, you're sitting in that heat of a propane stove. It, you know, it was just uncomfortable and no fun. I cooked them lunch, uh, fed them a hot meal. I have a grill outside. I got frostbite that day. No kidding. And I drove back to their, to their car, sent them on their way. Um, but I, they never came back. They're not repeat clients. They didn't have a good time. And, and so what I learned as a guide is if I know for sure the clients are not going to have a good time and the trip, give the money back, whatever it takes, because if they don't have a good time, they're going to tell their friends they have a good time. Um, they're not going to be repeat customers. It doesn't, if it doesn't, you know, you might make 300 bucks or whatever it is, but there's no value in the end of that if you can't make more money later. And so now what I do is if it's sub zero windy, I call it unsafe. Which it is. You can yeah. die in that. You totally. can die in that minutes. <laughs> yeah, sixteen is so, crazy. That I means negative sixteen is seems like wow, that is intense. Yeah, well, especially with the wind. Oh, and the wind, which makes it probably yeah, yeah. like negative yeah, forty. Was, there was thirty five mile winds out all morning. That, so now I don't go out in that kind of weather with clients. And I, even on my own, I rarely bother. Like it's there's so many days where it's twenty five degrees, sunny, and no wind <laughs> that you can have a great time ice fishing. <laughs> You don't have to kill yourself in that sub-zero stuff. No, no, no. And okay. especially you don't need to ruin a client's day. God, okay. you know? that, that's a good, that takes us a good perspective on it. So let, let's talk about just um, ice fishing gear. Let, let's talk about what you mentioned, some things you need. But if, if I mean, if you're going out there, say I was going out there on my own. I don't know if mm-hmm. people do this. If I'm just like, it's I got you. family up in the area and I'm yeah. like, you know what? I want to go ice fishing. So what do I need? What, what are the basics? Right. The basics. The very hardest thing about ice fishing is making a hole in the ice. Right, so you need some sort of a chisel or an auger. A chisel is only going to do you any good in the first month of the season, maybe the first two weeks, and then you can because with the you know chisel you can chisel out a hole in the ice. But once the ice is you know a foot thick, which happens usually by January, uh, chiseling out a hole to fish in will take you all day, and you just wreck yourself with it. So a chisel is okay, but an auger is better. And there's gas augers, which I I don't use. There's hand augers, which are fine. And then uh, the auger I use attaches to a, a DeWalt drill. And so I can just drill dozens of holes that way. Um, what I find when I was first starting ice fishing, this is my recommendation for anyone who's new at it. Go get a six pack of beer and get a, get a, go, go to Walmart or wherever you buy your or independent tackle shops and buy your you know, w- one little ice fishing rod and, and grab your favorite jigs. Even if it flies, you can like, like nymphs work great. Uh, it's like bead heads they have to sink. Um, we don't fish with lead in New Hampshire. I recommend anyone anywhere don't fish with lead. Lead's awful. Stop it if you're using lead. I don't care if it's law or not. Don't do it. Tungsten. That's my thing. Tungsten. Tungsten is great for ice fishing. A little, in fact, a little tungsten jig for ice fishing is wonderful. And have you, you know those little cush balls the kids have? They have all the hairy little rubber strings on them. Uh, not really. No. So there's little balls. They sell them at the dollar store. Okay. <laughs> and they're called cush balls, and they've got rubber strings on them. You can use those as bait. Oh wow! Or you can, or you can um, grab a microfiber mop and tie a mop fly oh, yeah. onto your and jig, and those crush it <laughs> for everything. They're great. Nice. Even I use those all summer too. Um, okay. <laughs> mop, mop flies are amazing. I can't believe people hate them. Wow. Um, I'm sure you could do a whole show on that on how oh, yeah. people hate flies. Um, <laughs> so are you using bait? So you're not using bait necessarily. I use bait sometimes. But typically, I use soft plastics, or I'll use a fly, um, a, a little, or tiny bucktails that we tie. Oh yeah, cool. Or my friend, my friend, my partner, business partner, Vinny ties them. I don't tie anything. Yeah. So are you? And you're the rod you're using? Are you using like a typical spin rod? I use a little spinning rod. Yeah, but um, I actually have a couple spinning rods that have fly reels on them that I use for ice fishing too, because that inline reel of a fly rod is actually better for ice fishing because there's no line memory. Oh so yeah. So typically, a spinning rod, you have that kind of sideways spool. And you get, you Man. get memory. You get this is amazing. Here. This is almost, I mean, it's almost a fly fishing episode we're doing here, right? I yeah. Mean, it's, it's ice fishing, but I didn't realize there was so much of the fly in it. Oh yeah. That's cool. Yeah, lots of people fish and, and we use all kinds of stuff too. It's not just that, but I, since it's a fly fishing show I'm on, I figured I'd talk about the fly part. Um, I was saying, so typically, so all you really need is a jigging rod. Some sort of hook with that weighs something. So that's why, you know, the bead head nymphs or the little tungsten jig with something tied on it. Uh, is all you need and a hole in the ice. And what I and the reason that six pack of beer is important. Uh, this is this is how I learned to ice fish. The very first time I ever ice fished, I moved to New Hampshire about 26 years ago, 
And uh, I was driving around the northern part of the state, and I always wanted to try ice fishing, and I never I knew anything about it. So I saw a guy out fishing on a lake called Squam Lake, and he was out by himself, old guy, catching fish and dropping perch on the ice. So I went to the local store, and I bought a six-pack of Bud Light, which I don't like, but, you know, yep. cheap. So I, I grabbed that, and I walk out on the ice, and I put that six-pack down next to the dude, and I said, can you show me how to do this? And he didn't say a word. He leaned down, cracked a beer, hand me his rod. <laughs> And he took another ride out, and I was sitting next to him on a bucket, jigging next to him, and he, without almost ever talking to me at all, he went through three beers, and I ended up catching my first yellow perch through the ice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And then, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. I like, so that's how I kind of like. That's cool. Got my, my, my taste for it. Yeah. Uh, and then I, after that, I spent, you know, years trying to figure out how to ice fish. I did the typical classic ice fishing um like the, the traditional ice fishing is trap setting and i don't know if you've ever seen an no. ice fishing trap but it's like it's like a pair of wooden it's a wooden x with a post in the middle so the x keeps the post in the water there's a spool under the water with a trigger and a flag on top and when the fish bites you put bait on it you lower it down to the depth you want it usually it's a minnow and then a when a fish eats it the flag pops up you yell flag and you run across the ice <laughs> you grab the string and you pull it in by hand Oh, man, that and sounds pretty each, fun, too. It can be. Each angler can set, uh, in New Hampshire, if it's not trout waters, can set six traps. I'm picturing this again. I'm picturing a, a guys out there, there's like a load of beer cans just laying all yeah. over the place. Guys are you know, half-wasted. Also, the flag goes up, and it's a it's a bad scramble over there, oh, yeah. like drunken scramble. Is that kind of is that kind of something? It's kind of a thing, yeah. And, and the reason that happens is because typically nothing happens. Exactly. You go all day, and then all of a sudden, boom, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, in my, where, where I guide, I don't use those traps very often. Uh, we jig because I want the clients actively catching fish. And so um, we had a, we, I had a family of four out, and they were, we were fishing pretty hard. They're probably, in the, in the two and a half hours uh, with them, they probably had 25 light perch, which we were targeting that day. And another family was out on the ice with us, and the other family had set six traps per person. So six times four people was that 24 traps they had on the ice. And they caught zero fish in the time that we loaded up almost with our limit on white perch. And we, we were doing is we were fishing each hole for four or five minutes and moving like you would anywhere else. You don't spin. And what they did is they set their traps. And once you set those traps, you're stuck in that spot. You're not moving. It's too much work. You know, because these traps can take you five minutes to set up and then you got to pick it up after. It's just pain that they, I hate them. Yeah. <laughs> so, Totally. I don't like fishing, which I do like chasing flags. Like if someone else sets the traps for me, I'm happy to go pull a fish out of the water. I don't like setting them up, but I definitely, at the end of the day, so I, uh, when I first started guiding, I, I would set traps for people. So at the end of the day, I'd be picking up 30 ice fishing traps. It's sun setting. It's, you know, 12 Ooh. degrees out. It's breezy. Yeah, no you have to reach in the water. You got to reel this line, hand reel it onto their spools, put it away so it's not all tangled. Nightmare. And you're, it's, I, it's awful. That, that's, so. Yeah. So I've invested in sonars for my clients, and they're just uh, they're they're very traditional um, sonars. Um, they're what's the what's the is there a model or something you can look yeah? At? I mean, I'm I'm not a brand person, but uh, I use I like the Humminbird, uh, but but a lot of people love um, a, a lot of people like Markham. A lot of people love um, Vexlars, uh, they, but they're all the same. They're all they do the same thing. There's not a bad. You can't get one that just doesn't give you good information. They're all pretty good. Yeah, you can spend more on on more dialed in stuff. You know, you can you can spend anywhere from three hundred to three thousand dollars on garbage, but and then there's digital ones now, which are even more expensive. But but I like these really simple ones. Hummingbird I like because the screen is so big, so easy to read. And but what is it? They're they're an analog machine. They're not digital at all. You so you put the sonar in the water. It it pings the, the transducer in the water. It pings the bottom, and it reads it on a screen that has a spinning light in a box. And that spinning light will change colors. And those, you want to read, want to read the colors. You can read, we can read the depth, and you can tell if there's fish are there. And the really cool thing is, you can see your bait. So you can have a, you know, a one sixteenth ounce tungsten jig, with a little piece of plastic on it, and you can see that as it goes down. And then you'll see other lines on the screen that are the fish. And then all you have to do is find out what that fish wants you to do, to make a bite. So you see you dance a little bit, and you see the fish react because it's moving up towards it, and. Uh, when they hit it, you set the hook and you're real efficient. And it's it's way fun. And I find like like ten year old girls, my my daughters especially, they can read that screen so fast and so well 
and they catch so many fish, and like better than I can. And there's something about girls, they have a touch for it. Same sexist, but I, I find girls out ice fishing boys make there two you to go. one. There you go. I don't know why. I think I think just in general, uh, women are better at, I mean, because same thing with fly fishing. I think they're typically um, better at stuff than men. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, I, I don't know if I... You, they're smarter than yeah. us probably. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> it, I think there's something about, there's some truth to that for sure. Because fly tying, for example, that's another one that they're very good at and I, I don't know exactly what it is but no that's cool man and yeah so you're i've got you, you that's right you have 10 and two two daughters two daughters yeah they're now 13 and 11 oh 13 11 that's right so i'm at uh i've got uh, almost nine and six year old daughters oh so you're two daughters as well yeah yeah oh yeah we're like twins yeah we're total yeah. twins yeah this is amazing <laughs> we're gonna we're have to hook up and do some ice fishing oh man if you ever get to new hampshire i'd love to take oh, you out. i would love to, i'd love to get out there like i said where, where do you live uh so i'm out on the other side portland oregon Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. So we're yeah, way uh, out. Way, so way it's out. like six thirty in the morning for you out there. Yeah, this is a little bit earlier, but I, I love this is great because I get a podcast in and then it gives gets me a head start on the day and you know what I mean. So And as a fisher, getting up early is no big deal. No, no, I love getting up early. I'm, that's my struggle is that I'm actually an early riser and a late uh, you know, I, I go to bed late, so it's like I'm I'm probably killing myself sometimes. I'm sure I am, oh, but I love it. My yeah. wife my, my my if my wife would tolerate it, I would go to bed at eight o'clock every night. No kidding. I I'm a, I'm a, I wake up at four o'clock every day. Oh wow! I yep. Can't can't sleep past four. I don't know what. Yeah. Going so you on. can't do a go to bed at uh, midnight, wake up at four. No, I do that too. Yep. I can't sleep past four, no matter what it is. Oh wow! So if I do stay up late, I still get up stupid early. Oh, there <laughs> so. you go. See, that's where we're different. Is I could sleep in not till like ten, like when I was a you know teenager, but I could sleep in for sure in the morning. I love sleeping in. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, let's get back. Let's get back to the gear really quick. Yeah, what are we talking about? Yeah, yeah. I want to make sure we don't miss. <laughs> I want to make sure we don't miss this gear. So what you're saying is I could get a drill, something to drill into the ice, uh, bring my yep. fishing rod, my, you know, just my flies. And yep. pretty much that's all I need to catch a, a fish. Uh-uh. It's all you need. Yeah. So no tent, no, 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 uh, you don't really, so you can just forget about the tent. Well, it depends on how hard. So if, if, if you just want a taste of ice fishing, you don't spend a lot of money at first. You know, find a way to make a hole in the ice, pick a day that's not going to kill you to be out in the weather <laughs> and go fishing, right? Uh, you can, I do, I do use fishing tents. We love them. I have a couple of portables. Uh, they're insulated. And on those cold days, having a tent with a Mr. Heater or whatever in them is, is wonderful. You know, I've got an Eskimo, which I really like. I have clam stuff, which I don't like as much. The, the zippers always break on my clam stuff. So I'm not a big, not a big uh, proponent of <laughs> clam tents right now. <laughs> I burnt through them too fast. Um, but they, I mean, they're, they're nice. Um, and a lot of people love them, so I don't want to disparage any brands, uh, and especially if they want to sponsor me. Um, but the, yep. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't, I, don't, I don't care about brands. What you want to do is if, if, if you are going to do a lot, you do want a way to get out of the weather. Um, but you can get out of the weather with good clothes. Yeah, exactly. So you don't necessarily Bits. need a tent. You need to be warm and dry. And uh, the, Nor- the Norwegians say there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. And so layer up, no cotton. Your feet are probably the most important uh, part of ice fishing. So you want waterproof boots. You want wool socks. Um, you want layers and layers and layers. What boots do you like? I use muck boots. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mucks are all. It's like insulated, like those full hardcore. Yeah, they're, they're winter. I use, I use the chore boots, too. I don't care because, again, I'm going to wear warm socks. So what I need to be is dry. And I'll put, if it's really cold out, I'll stick in the you know, toe warmers and that sort of thing. Um, and then layers I, and I, my, my ice fishing bibs are a float suit. So for safety, if you want to be safe, you can buy, you can spend a lot of money on, on, on clothes that are buoyant. So you can't sink if you fall through the ice. Just like a dry suit. No, it's, it looks like snow pants, but it's, oh, wow, it's, but a, it's, it's called a float suit. Um, and if you fall in, you float. Yeah. It's not a, you know, not a PFD, like, not a life jacket, but it, it, because it's not, won't pass the coast guard test. Oh, gotcha. That that's the one thing for me being like a weenie western. You know, I'm thinking about the ice fishing. It's like, man, that's scary to me. Thinking like falling in through the ice, and now you're trying to not not die, right? I mean, how often do you ever hear of people falling through the ice? Every year, and I, in fact, um, I I did a show on this a few years ago. Gosh, I was a, uh, I couldn't put a date on it anymore. But a few years ago, I was I wasn't fishing. I was actually at a meeting in town, and the meeting happened to be on a pond. And it came out at nine o'clock at night and there was a guy on the ice screaming. 
And it turned out there was a guy who was crossing the pond. He fell through because this pond he was on was actually a damned river. And I tried to rescue him. I fell through trying to rescue him. And by the time the fire department got him, I got myself, I self-rescued myself, but, but he did not make it. Jeez. So I was with him. I was the last person to talk to him when he died. Holy crap. Yeah. So I take ice safety very seriously. So if it's not, I, I don't, I don't take clients out on unsafe ice unless it's a foot of water. <laughs> so, um, so if there's any question about safety at all, the trip is over. It's done. We don't do it. In fact, last year, this happened to me in the springtime. Um, the spot we were fishing, it, we were, it happened to be in March and we were fishing ice that was two feet thick and the temperature spiked to 70 degrees while we were fishing, Jeez. which is delightful. You're getting the sun, <laughs> you're in a t-shirt and all that stuff. But the, what happens is on the shallow water on the edges, it turns to uh, slushy. It, yeah. Like, like it, the material feels like, you know, I, you know the, the slushy machine oh, yeah. slushies you eat. Yep. The ice on the edge turns to that during the course of the day because the, the sand warms up and it heats from the bottom. Mm. And so at the end of the day, I was, it was about an hour before the day was over. I was walking back to my truck to go get, I probably had to pee or something, but yeah. <laughs> to go get something. And I fell through, I, but I fell through shallow water ice. Yeah. And went, and it, and it, this is the sound it makes. Shh. That's it. That's because it's not breaking and cracking. You're just oh, right. through. And so I fell through. I, I got my, it was only waist deep. Yeah. I got myself out. I went and found a big plank and put it on the ice. And I announced to the client, your trip's over. I gave, yep. them, half their, I gave them half their money back. Hmm. You know, because I ended their trip early. I said, it's for safety reasons. We got them off the ice. And Vinny and I, my partner, while we were unloading it, we had to go back on the ice and get all of our gear. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we each fell through three or four times getting our gear off the ice. But luckily it was shallow water. But as soon as you know it's not safe, your job as a guide is get those clients to safety. So yep. we, we, before we deal, dealt with our gear, we got them off the ice. And then we dealt with all the gear. Gotcha. But we were both were wearing float suits. I mean, we're gonna, nothing going to happen. It's also 70 degrees out. So when you get out of the water, you take your pants off in the sun and you're, you're fine. <laughs> wow. Okay. But, that, but as far as – but midwinter, like there is no danger. Like it's – biggest danger with ice fishing is getting cut on an auger – or slips and falls. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So I can see I hit your head on that ice. You're, oh my you're, god, you're hurting. Yeah, we have you know we have a micro spikes that we keep and we we wear those and. Oh, you do. Yeah, you screw in spikes to your studs to your boots. Yeah, and we encourage the clients to to do something for their shoes too. We don't typically supply them to the clients because we don't always get them back. We learned right away that if you give some the client something to put on their shoe when they leave, that's still on their shoe. <laughs> oh, wow. Are you guys, are you just out there and then all of a sudden like a crazy guy with his truck is driving across, skidding across the ice? Are you, are you getting cars? Oh, sure. And t- sorry, one time I was, this is great. You'll love this story. I, I went out, I wasn't guiding. I was just, I went out ice fishing on my own, um, on, on a pond. Nobody was fishing this pond. It was like, there was a foot of snow. I had to drag, it was before I had a snowmobile. I had to drag my gear out. I set up a little tent, sit in my tent, sitting in there jigging. I caught a couple of uh, yellow perch. I pulled out a big pickerel and had a good time. And then I look out the window and there's a tractor on the ice with a giant blade, you know, like a road grading tractor, Jeez. This is a huge tractor. There's no joke around like road, like, like road making tractor. And they, they all around in a figure eight shape, they carved this road on the ice with this big blade. And by the way, I'm in the middle of one of the circles in the figure eight fishing. Oh my God. So right around. So he's doing it around you. Yeah. So then he pulls off the ice. I'm sitting inside fishing, having a good time still. And then a bunch of trucks pull up and a bunch of dirt bikes get out. Oh, my god! And they gosh. had a dirt bike, like a rally, on the ice around Really? My- and they didn't, did they, like, wave at you or stop by and say, hey, we're going to do a rally? Nope, not, not, not one <laughs> word. And there was, like, a dozen motorcycles on the ice. <laughs> driving That's all unbelievable. Around. Yeah. I wow. Got fish that day. The water, you can, in the ice fishing hole, it's like the water's rumbling. You know, it's just boiling out of the ice fishing hole. It was fun. Oh my gosh! All right. Well, that's another, another good story. I was going to ask you a couple of crazy stories. That's this is the good thing. I haven't even well, had to bring it up. They're just well, come and then naturally. On, on Lake Winnipesaukee, I was fishing uh, once during the ice fishing derby. I don't fish derbies because I don't like catch and yeah. kill derbies. That's a, ice fishing derbies are typically killing fish uh, oh, yeah. shows. But I like to go out to the spectacle and interview people. So I was fishing that derby during the derby once and talking to people. And I was sitting on the ice, and that little airplane comes and lands next to me on the ice. And the guy climbs out of the, out of the side of the plane. He drills a hole in the ice and sits on the stairs and fishes right there next huh. to his airplane. And uh, cool. Lake, Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire, our biggest lake in the state, is the only FAA-approved airport on ice. So there actually is an airport on that lake too. 
that's a full on no kidding you know, with traffic control and everything <laughs> airport yeah <laughs> Cool. Well, what what before we get out of here, I want to check just on. Um, I'm not sure if you're like a historian as far as ice fishing, but is there is there there must be a long history there. Do you know any of that? And um, I mean, it must be people have been ice fishing for as long as they've been alive, right? Oh, I imagine. I mean, as soon as people realized you can make a hole in the ice, I'm sure they did. I yeah. know for sure, like the Algonquin Indians. I don't know, Indians yep. right anymore. I don't, I don't know the right words, but uh, I know the the Algonquins so would. Uh, would ship holes in the ice and fish, and you know that the Inuit people also did that. So, yeah. and I imagine all across Europe, anywhere there's ice, there's a history of ice fishing. Um, but I haven't researched it much. I've seen, yeah. I've seen examples of ice fishing hooks from, you know, from, from the from the day. But I, I oh right, I haven't done any real research on. It. Usually bone hooks. Yeah, and typically they're designed to make the fish swallow. So yeah. Okay, I'm yeah, thinking. Um... They, don't, they don't catch and release back in the day. No, no, exactly. So you do. So you do a lot of catch and release. I do mostly catch. I would say eighty to ninety percent. Um, and to be honest, though, like I, I do that mo- most most of the year. I release almost every fish. If I'm going to eat fish, typically it's it's ice fishing where I'll eat them. Um, yeah. So like if I want to fish fry, I usually eat more fish in the winter than I do in the summer. And if I'm going to, and I, I'm usually targeting a fish that's pretty invasive, like a white perch, mm-hmm. uh, and where you can catch like twenty of them and have big fish fry. But I am going to, my first, when they like freeze this year, I am going to eat my first brook trout account catch of the season. Yeah. Which I don't typically do, but I'm, uh, for, for Christmas this year, I, I, I have a bunch of cedar planks I got for nothing and I make my own maple syrup. So this year for Christmas, people are going to get a couple of maple planks nice. and a little jar of syrup Ooh. and a recipe for maple planked, um, salmon the, or that trout. sounds amazing. And. And they'll be able to take the planks and that syrup I gave them and go to the store and buy a fish or catch their own fish and cook a fish using what I gave them. That's what I'm, that's what I'm doing for Christmas this year for nice people. Nice work. That, that's perfect. That's yeah. perfect. And because I'm cheap. No, that's, um, I mean, that's not cheap. <laughs> I'll tell you what, syrup is expensive, right? Yeah, but it comes out, it comes out of the trees in my yard. Oh, my gosh. You guys have, yeah. see, you have some cool, <laughs> that's a, back at the start, right, the comparison between you and, and Costa Rica. You guys have, uh-huh. you guys have some good stuff going there. Even though it's a little cold, it, it's uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's still it's still good to go. And uh, okay, well, yeah. hey, before um, before we get out, I just want to check. You know, obviously, you have a guiding service, so if people were out in your neck of woods, they could check in with you. Is there any other, you know, resources, or if somebody wanted to follow up and learn more about ice fishing, or you know, regardless of where that is, that you would send them? Do you have anything on your site or anything else? Yeah, there's not a lot on my site. Although if you, now you've hit on a, something that's a hole in my world where I should do that. But um, what I I mean, Facebook has lots of groups dedicated to ice fishing. And if you're in a region that has it, I'm sure your state has it has ice fishing. There's like like for New Hampshire, there's there's a bunch of sites called like Ice Fish NH or New Hampshire Ice Fishing. Um, there's also like Ice Junkies is a big one. Um, I follow. I don't live anywhere near Minnesota, but Minnesota has got so many lakes and so many people ice fishing. I follow their pages, their groups on Facebook. I'm a member of a lot of their groups because I can learn a lot. There's also a lot of jerks in those groups who know more than anybody and will just uh, troll you to death. So you have to have a thick skin. So if you, you know. <laughs> be able to tolerate asking a qu- question that you know is kind of dumb, but you need the answer to. If people are going to go, that's dumb, and you know, you know the type of people. So, have you heard of Lake of the Woods ice fish? Is that is that a popular? Yes. Uh, seems like maybe that's the first name that comes out when people hear I- the word ice fishing. Is that something special? Yeah, that's a huge Midwest. Um, I don't know much about it. I know people who go there and fish every year, yeah. and I don't. Yeah, care. totally. Uh, not a big deal. <laughs> so that's my problem. I don't care about stuff. Um, I like I like fishing, but I'm not I'm not like a. I don't think anyone's fishing is better than someone else's fishing. So there's not a destination spot for ice fishing that you just have to go to somewhere in the world. Well, no, that's not true because I would love to go. I would love to go um, to Alaska and catch burbot. Are oh, you burbot. burbot. Yeah. Yeah. We have them in New Hampshire, but they don't typically get giant here. Now, for people who don't know, burbot are the only freshwater example of a codfish so and they in the summer they go through what's called estivation do you know what that means uh no i don't i'm gonna teach you something yeah All right, estivation is like hibernation but you do it in warm weather all right so they will typically in the summer will burrow down the mud and barely move from like april until about november and then as the lakes start freezing these fish get really really active and they look like people call them eel pouts in some parts of the country they look like a hybrid catfish and eel like they're just gross looking big fish and they can get to 30 40 pounds in some states like Alaska and they live only in the northern northern hemisphere 
and only in deep glacial lakes. So typically, there's been they've been they've been dropped in other waters, but that's typically where they live. Um, and you can only catch them mostly in the wintertime through the ice. And they just get so big, and they taste they taste like cod. So <laughs> they're just go. huge, just monster fish. You can only get a little bit of time a year, uh, and they're really cool. So I, I like to do more burbot fishing, but somewhere that has big ones. Yeah, perfect, like Alaska. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, Clay. Well, I guess that's about it. Uh, do you want to leave us with a um, maybe in the next uh, fi- uh, few months any any strange uh, things you want to have come upcoming for you? Anything weird that's uh, you well, can just yeah. Leave? So coming up in January. So we do it once a year. We on the Fish Nerds podcast. We 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 like eating fish. We like talking about eating fish, and we do a tinned fish special. We call it the tinned fish challenge, where we will go buy some canned fish. Some it tastes some taste great. And some we have no idea what we're getting into, and we do a big uh, show where we eat tinned fish and laugh and tell stories about the tinned fish we're eating. And that's a lot of fun. That's coming up in January. Oh, nice. We do book, um, we have the Fish Nerds Book Club, where we're this this month we are reviewing The Feather Thief. So that's mm-hmm. our book club this month. That's a fly fishing book, if you want to nice. keep up there. Um, we've had John Gierick on the show twice. That's amazing. You had him on uh, twice. I saw that. Sorry, Gierock. Gierock. Excuse me. Yeah, don't be fancy, fancy you... fly fishers. Correct me too much. That's yeah. he's the rock star. He he is one of the rock star. Mate, well, for writers, he is the for rock writers. star. And you've had him on twice. That's that's twice. awesome. Yeah, I even got him on a computer the very most recent time. So that was there that was go. a win. There <laughs> so you go. During the COVID lockdown, when he couldn't go on a book tour, he was like, "I have come on your show." Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. You have you had him on your show? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yep, had had him on way back. Uh, I can't remember what episode, but it was a long time ago, and he was amazing. Yeah, he he described this. He described this story of flying um, out of Alaska, and he was in mm-hmm. on this river with this float, this crazy float plane pilot, and he was hundred percent sure they were going to crash. And then the yeah. pilot banked it left at the last minute and pulled it out, and it was like no big deal. But, oh, so uh, scary. <laughs> yeah, the gear rock is yeah. I love love his stuff for sure. So. Yeah, he's great, and and um, yeah, we have all, we have all, we have all, all kinds of fun. We have um, our fish scientist Doc Martin come back. We're gonna we do um, we talk about some fish biology. So we have all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. We talk about fishing, and we make fart jokes too. So it's the whole thing. Nice, nice. Well, let's, yeah. we're gonna have to keep in touch now that we got the I got the second podcast oh, and, now. And, and our Valentine's special. Oh wow. I, so every year I do this special, a, a sexy fish special, and I play this music. Uh huh. Listen. Isn't that sexy? Oh yeah. Sounds like the Beatles. <laughs> Come on. Come on. It's all about spawning. But anyway, we play the sexy music, and we have guests on. Last year. We had two other podcasters on uh, who were female podcasters, and we did uh, a quiz show where they had to guess what well, guess were we talking about a sex toy or a fly? Oh, no kidding! And that was, and this year there's a Damn. woman named Reba Sparrow who makes a podcast called The Mystery Box. It's a, a it's a sexy yep. it's a sex story podcast where people tell their sex stories. She's going to come on the show for a Valentine special, and we're going to do um, crazy fish sex things fish do to get laid. And she's going to come on as a co-host and make the human comparison to crazy humans. So we have all, we're everything. Yeah, you got you got tons of yeah. crazy. Yeah, that was the easy answer yeah. for you. Okay, <laughs> that's all so. we do. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. We, all right. Know, we actually, we talk about fly fishing too. We do have a fly fishing correspondent. Oh, you do? Yeah, Rich Collins is our fly fishing correspondent, and we do talk fly fishing too. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah usually yeah. make fun of him, but yeah. Where's Where's Rich out of? He's in New Hampshire. Oh wow! Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you guys are. That's right. Okay. Yep. Cool. Well, I'll link out to you know everything we talked about here today, and uh, and just uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch with you. This is going to be awesome to um, you know see all these. Uh, I'm not sure, man. You got so many crazy events. It's like I have to pick one. I think the uh, maybe the 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 <laughs> the Valentine's Day sounds pretty interesting. That is so much fun. I get so uncomfortable too. Like it's so outside of my comfort zone, and that's why it's so much fun because they. I usually have I always have female guests on because I don't know the rules, and they always go places I won't I won't ever go to, to a woman ever. That's what you want, uh, totally. What, 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 what's a podcasting? Just before we leave, like you know, obviously it's a ton of work. Well, what do you love most, or you know, and why do you still do the podcast? Are you doing it weekly? I do it weekly. Although in November I did it daily because it was National Podcast Posting Month. Um, I do it weekly. I've been doing it weekly for since 2011. Um, I think we are one of the oldest fishing shows. Yeah, wow, 2011. So you're you've got me by you've got me by six years at least. Oh yeah, yeah. 
I'm the grandfather of fishing you, podcasts. You are. So, so what, what, what keeps you going? What, why do you still do it? And, and when are you going to, and when are you going to quit? I, I don't know how, well, my wife would like me to quit, but, um, audience interaction, the fact that people are listening and they care. If I skip a week, I get messages and people are going, where's my show? Uh, and when we do something really interesting, people respond to it. It's, it's interaction. We have a Facebook group that's very active and, and, uh, we get all of our ideas, no, a lot of ideas right from there. And I do it cause it's fun. It's like, you know, it's another hobby. It's, it's creating art, you know, and yeah. if people don't, you know, some people paint, some yep. people write, some people sculpt and some people create audio and that's just as much art as anything else. Yep. And that's how I create. So, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Awesome. All right, Clay, well, I'll let you get out of here and uh, we'll catch uh, catch up with you soon. All right, thanks, Dave. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all links and everything else we covered today, head over to webflyswing.com slash 240. We are still uh, doing some live podcasts as time allows. You can go to wetflyswing.com slash live and uh, find out uh, what we have going. So far, we're still on Clubhouse but there's a bunch of uh, opportunities coming up here. So um, stay tuned for that and uh, check us out and see what we have going here. That's pretty much it. That's a wrap today. I want to thank uh, Clay again for putting together this great show and, and holding, hanging in there with me. Um, it's It's been good. Always looking forward to mixing it up. So uh, looking forward to maybe seeing you soon, maybe catching you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.